Hey there students and welcome back to Intensive Review. In this segment we're going to look at USHC 2.2 which focuses on two things, the Monroe Doctrine and Manifest Destiny. So your question about this indicator could have to do with one of those things. So first of all, <laughs> all right, forgot my clicker. All right, first of all, the Monroe Doctrine. All right. Now, what was happening is there are a lot of revolutions going on in Latin America. And how does the United States weigh in on this? Because keep in mind that Washington and Jefferson had already said, we're staying out of Europe. We're not going to make alliances with Europe. We don't want to get involved in all their stuff or anything like that. So how do we respond to these revolutions? And Europe wants the colonies back and there is some plotting and scheming amongst European governments. We want to go over there and take them back over. So the United States articulates the Monroe Doctrine where President Monroe says the American continents are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. Now what exactly does this say? What I think about is I think about George H.W. Bush who in 1988 said, read my lips, no new taxes. All right, now that's what he said. He ended up signing a tax increase. All right, but he said no new taxes. So when I think about this, I think of James Monroe as a George H.W. Bush who actually meant what he said or something like that. So Europe, read our lips, no new colonies. And the only thing is that there was really a limited impact, that the Monroe Doctrine is important really just as an articulation of American policy more than it actually accomplishing much of anything. Now, of course, the British kind of backed us up on it, so that was good. But the legacy of the Monroe Doctrine, later on when the United States actually is a powerful country and we become the largest industrial power in the world, Teddy Roosevelt is going to use the Monroe Doctrine as a justification for very heavy U.S. intervention in Latin America to keep European powers from intervening to collect debts and other things. So the legacy of the Monroe Doctrine is very important for our foreign policy and also when you think about the Cold War and the efforts we made to keep communism from expanding into Latin America. This is, you know, really kind of a definition of our foreign policy. Now then we go on to manifest destiny, all right? This idea of sea to shining sea. Now this cartoon, which hopefully you've seen before, is called American Progress. Now of course this is American Progress as defined in 1872. Today, if somebody painted this, then they would be seen as very racist and one-dimensional and that sort of thing, ethnocentric, if you will. But what you see here in the middle, you see Lady Liberty, who is holding a book, which we can presume to be the Bible. In another hand, she's holding telegraph wires. You see behind her farms and ships and choo-choo trains. You see a stagecoach, Pony Express guy, all of that kind of stuff. Civilization, that where she's been, it is light. Where she has yet to be, it is dark. And we see where she has yet to be. We see the buffalo. We see the Indians. We see just darkness. That has to go. And the implication here is in order to have progress, the stuff that is inhibiting progress, whether it be Native Americans, whether it be the buffalo, that it's all got to go. And so that's the idea of manifest destiny. And now manifest means that something's evident, obvious, apparent, plain. It's just so obvious that it is our destiny, okay? That is something that is predetermined typically by a higher power. So when you look at manifest destiny, it's the idea that God wants us to expand all the way to the Pacific, sea to shining sea. And you can see in Jefferson's inaugural address where his first inaugural address, he calls this a chosen country that really that we have been kindly separated by nature and a wide ocean from the exterminating havoc of one quarter of the globe from Europe. And we have a chosen country with room enough for our descendants to the thousandth and thousandth generation. 
Now, Jefferson wasn't necessarily a Christian, but he was a believer in divine providence. And he said that, look, in his second inaugural address, he says, we need to commit ourselves to this being in whose hands we are, who led our fathers just like he led Israel of old. For Jefferson, the United States, keep in mind those who labor the earth are the chosen people of God, that Americans are a chosen people, and they are meant to inherit as much of the earth as they can. So American progress, in order for progress to move forward, the stuff in front has to go. So westward expansion is a God-given right, really a God-given ultimatum that is just obvious that God wants us to go all the way. And part of that going all the way is to annex as much land as we can get. And Texas fought a war for independence in the 1830s. I think there's something coming on the History Channel pretty soon about that. It looks kind of interesting with Bill Paxton. So looking forward to watching that. But you've got the Alamo, the Battle of San Jacinto. Not likely that you're going to get a lot of details from this war. But keep in mind that this war was fought between Texas and Mexico. And Texas at this time was an independent country. Keep in mind the Lone Star State. When you've got one star, this is showing that you are independent. In Texas, they're still proudly Texan. I lived about... 20 miles from the Texas border when I was growing up. So not quite a Texan, but Texans are very proud. It's hard to get out-of-state tuition. Like the out of the in-state tuition at Texas schools is awesome. The out-of-state tuition, not so good. I mean, Texas is still very, very independent-minded. So this Lone Star Republic, which is going to exist for a little while because the United States isn't fully committed to manifest destiny before the 1840s. And so in 1837, Texas petitions the U.S. for annexation. And the U.S., no. Two reasons. First of all, we don't want to get in a border dispute with Mexico. Second of all, this balance of power between the slave states and the free states, that there was an effort here to make sure that neither the slave states nor the free states were to get predominance in the Union. And this border dispute here, so you've got Texas, which Mexico said, okay, we recognize your independence, but we recognize your independence up to this border. And Texas said, no, uh, the Rio Grande, Rio Grande, uh, depending on how you pronounce it. So when we annex Texas with their stated borders, then we enter into a conflict with Mexico. So annexation equals war. And then we look at the balance of slave and free states. In the 1830s, there were actually more slave states by one than free states. So the North wasn't really crazy about annexing another slave state that was really big and could conceivably be split into several slave states. So internal strife, which in the 1830s, politicians tried to avoid. 1850s will be another story. So meanwhile, manifest destiny, this whole idea. In the 1844 presidential election, James K. Polk of the Democrats is going against Henry Clay of the Whig Party. And the Whig Party, which is, has its power, had its power base in the Northeast, was against expansion. So this becomes really a one-issue kind of campaign. Are we going to have manifest destiny or not? And what we see here, we see Texas trying to come into the Union, Polk's trying to welcome them home, and the Whig Party's trying to keep them from coming in with the help of abolitionists who were generally unpopular in the country as a whole at that time. So Polk wins, and so does manifest destiny. And so in 1845, by joint resolution of Congress, Texas is annexed. And then the Mexican War, which, again, manifest destiny. All right, that is one of the wars of manifest destiny. We're almost there. We've got this little bit here. We've got Texas. We've got the Oregon Treaty. We need to take care of the rest of it. And there's a war. All right, and this war is part, partly because of our desire to move west and take some of that land. And General Winfield Scott gets to Mexico City. We take the capital. We win big. And we occupy Mexico City. And we take land. All right, the Mexican Cession, which Mexico gives us almost half their country, really. A lot of their, you know, a lot of their really good land, which there are some people that said, well, actually, you know, we took the whole thing and we won and we gave part of it back. I'm not sure if I buy that. But, you know, as far as this, it's it's a treaty. Okay, so, I mean, it's very controversial still today in Mexico, you know, how this land was pretty much, I mean, when you beat somebody in a war, you don't always take their half their country. But what you really need to know <laughs> excuse me, is the Mexican session happened in 1848, and it was a product of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. 
And there's a continuing controversy about it. This was an ad that ran in Mexico that ended up getting pulled because of controversy in the United States where Absolute sells a lot more of their product than in Mexico. So the Oregon Treaty, while in the campaign, James K. Polk said 54-40 or fight, didn't keep his campaign promise. Surprise, surprise. Politician didn't do that. So we compromised with Britain over the border of Oregon. And that pretty much completes Manifest Destiny. And we will be going on to talk about antebellum sectionalism in a moment. So hope you'll join us. See you in a bit.